So how was your August? My August. How was your August? You're in the cabin. I'm in the Didn't cabinet? You? No, not the cabinet. The cabin. Didn't you go to Maine? I did. I went to Maine. I went to this uh, beautiful little cabin in Maine, this kind of old, un well, it's slightly improved, like fishing shack by a <laughs> lake. Slightly improved fishing shack. It actually has been improved quite a bit. Everything works. I like to say there's no mod cons. Mod cons. But there were, what? there were, you know, there's running water. and No uh, mod cons? Modern conveniences. Ooh. Yeah. But there's Is running this... water and electricity. Wow, that's living, that's living yeah. large. But no broadband, I, I hope. And Wi-Fi. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Really? Totally Wi-Fi. Seriously? Yeah. What they have a landline going to the fishing shack? It's isn't actually that, uh, is there a federal a, law against that? <laughs> don't tell, don't tell anyone. I there's a a there's a, a line of sight that goes to a main house up on a hill. Oh, it's it's fixed wireless broadband. Yeah, so they have fiber to the house, and then we get like there's like a little dish pointed at. Oh the yeah, dish. yeah. That's what I did for a bunch of years. Yeah. So that's called yeah. fixed wireless broadband? Yeah, that's how I call it. Probably nobody cares about it anymore, but it's big in rural America. Yeah, it's basically just Wi-Fi with dishes. Yeah, yeah. So it was great. And, you know, right right on a lake, like right right on a lake. And uh, Did you go swimming in the lake? Oh, all the time. Yeah. Did it feel good? It felt great. Oh, there man. was a sandy, there's a sandy beach. Oh. Sandy beach in a lake. Oh. And, uh, you know, fish that are like swimming with you. And little fish, and an fish. eagle that nests like right Eats up the on fish. the point, right eating the fish. <laughs> Lots of ducks, loons. loons. What else? A martin that we named Doc Martin, of course, because you have to. What's a is a martin a bird or is it a, a furry animal? It's a ferret. It's yeah, that's why I thought it's like a in the weasel a family. And um, it's it may it 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 looks cute, but you do not want to hug it. It's a wild animal. There's a red fox that comes by every once in a while. Yeah. It's, uh, it's it sounds really great. something else. Yeah. Did the kids dig it? The kids love it. They love it. They spend all the time in the lake. They didn't drown, which is a plus. Yep. And uh, so we had no water accidents. And kayaks. We would like, oh, the girls went around and picked like a bucket of blueberries, wild blueberries. Absolutely. It's uh, made on the blueberries. Same, same property. And then baked a blueberry pie, a wow. blueberry custard pie. Found the Whoa. found the recipe on the internet, the New York Times cookbook, and carried it out. Like did the whole pie twice. Yeah, it was it was tremendous. It was great. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. My August. Your August. You want to hear about my mother? You want to hear? Yeah. <laughs> you want me to talk about my mother? <laughs> Tell you about my mother. <laughs> Where did that come from? Blade Runner somehow injected. It's Blade Runner. Yeah, yeah the Leon woods of Leon. Leon, tell me in I forget what the, Leon. Tell me in words, you know, only positive terms. Tell me about your mother, my mother. My mother. Let me tell you about my mother. <laughs> and then shoot some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Blade Runner. Um, I, most most of what's been happening in August is concerned with work. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I don't really like talking about work on the podcast terribly much because a, it's boring, and b, I, I'm not sure it's entirely appropriate. Um, but uh, it's just I'm dealing with this large, as I told you, this large software migration project, mm -hmm. and it really is. Um, it really is just like, oh my god, there's there's this insuperable problem, and you just go nuts, and you figure out that problem, you're like. Oh, 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 I dodged that bullet. And then all of a sudden, wham, this other thing comes along and you have yeah. to dodge that bullet and you have to figure out that one. Then you realize, oh my God, there's this other, and then there's other things where like, there's these things that you are, that you think are insuperable problems. And then somebody says, well, I don't really care that much about that feature. I don't really care if you have, okay, great. Okay. And you're just constantly, it, it's kind of exhilarating, but it's really unnerving. Um, and uh so that happened, and then something very recently happened, um, which is yeah, I can't talk about, but it's basically uh, I'll, I'll sorry, we have to snip this out. I'll talk to you about it later. But okay. um, 
but yeah, uh, August has been fine. The house is fine. My daughter's fine. Um, and uh, work is work. Um, and um, so as I, I sent you an email, um, I, you know, I've been drinking coffee for a long time, as yeah. have you. Um, and I find one problem with coffee is that beyond a certain point, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and also it makes me enraged. Like if when I drink coffee, I get very angry. Mm-hmm. You know, I get very, you know, I get very energetic, but I also get really kind of resentful too. I don't know. It's something about caffeine and my hippocampus, and my amygdala or whatever it is. And so a long story short, a couple of days ago, I found this, you know, you have those little boxes of tea lying in your cabinet for like 15 years. Yeah, and, you know, right. there's always one or two bags left. Yeah. Well, I had this box of this tea that I thought the, the uh, it's, it's a Stephen Smith tea. Okay. And um, it's a green tea. Um, and I took it and I made it, and I made, you know, a nice big, you know, coffee container of it and mm-hmm. I drank it. And that's what caused me to send you that quote from Mark Laner because I was burning with a hard gem like flame <laughs> for a long time. And the cool thing was no anger. It was all oh, just yeah. let's get things done. So let's just let's keep banging through this. And I was like, I went immediately online to Amazon and ordered like a pallet of right. this stuff. Um, and it's just it's amazing. And so I'm I'm kind of excited about that because coffee does make me very, very angry. And I had to, and I'm glad I gotten away from that now. Coffee has a sharp cue, you know, like it, like if you're equalizing something, you've got this parabolic wave and it just takes you up and then drops you. And so that's the time you reach for another cup of coffee and you sort of can't continue on these really sharp waves. Whereas I find tea, even black tea, it's much wider. So the path up is slower. The path down is slower. It seems friendly yeah. to me. It's great. So that, that's, that's, that's the, that's the exciting what else is exciting in my life? Well, I want to read more uh, of Mark Lehner. That's that's the thing. And actually, I asked you what book I should pick up, and I don't think you answered. Yes, I did. You said you said this one, but then I, you, you didn't say. Didn't I attach one. it? No. Was it an attachment to the email? I didn't see the attachment to the email. I mean, could well, take a look. Take a look. At, would you take a look at your email right now? I have to start up my email again. Jeez. I'll, I don't know. I'll look at the email. Well, I mean, I'm just wondering what the name of the book is. That's that's no, no. This is no, I sent it to you. I know you said. I it. sent the, I sent the book to you. But it's it doesn't. It doesn't that doesn't help anybody who's listening to to know what the name of the book is. Well, who cares about them? I mean, <laughs> honestly, we just yak away here. I don't hear from anybody. Nobody sends me a letter saying, "Hey, great podcast. Really love yeah, you. Changed true. my life." None, none. I never hear any of that stuff. So, for the people who are listening, you know, you need to start pulling your weight. Both of you. Uh, my cousin, my gastroenterologist. Okay, so that's the one. I'd heard of that book. Right. All right, I'll pick it He's up. He's most famous for the sequel. So I think his first one was I Smell Esther Williams, mm-hmm. which I find kind of incomprehensible. Um, there's a real arc to like the first three or four books, which is I Smell Esther Williams is just insane. And then my cousin, my cousin, my gastroenterologist is much more coherent, but still insane. And yeah. then he does Et Tu Babe, which is like yes. his fame. That's the one that put him on the map. And a lot of Everybody people knows, read yeah. that. And that is much more like a novel and arguably has a plot line, quote unquote. <laughs> yeah. um, but I find it, and there's some magnificent, in every Mark Laner book, there are, there, are mag, there are sentences that are worth entire books. Mm. There are single sentences that are worth entire books. Um, but I find that with my cousin gastroenterologist, it's the highest ratio of those magnificent sentences and those magnificent paragraphs. Um, his stuff, I don't know. I just, I, I, I can't, I can't enthuse. The only problem is that his stuff is, is I find, I, I recommend it to one person, and she said it changed her life. And I recommend it to another person, and they said, "Do not ever <laughs> recommend another book <laughs> to me ever again." I mean, some people find it really offensive, but to right. me, it's it's just ridiculously over the top. It's just, and it's very much, it's very much a an eighties thing. A lot of yeah. his stuff, 
It's yeah. very, very eight at two babe and my cousin, my gastroenterologist. There's a lot of eighties memes. You can tell he read a lot of William Gibson and he was very much into cyberpunk stuff like that. And he's just riffing on this stuff left, right, and center. But he is a magnificent writer. I love his vocabulary. I love his sentences. I could go on. I can I can quote and it's like Monty Python. I could quote endlessly from the stuff, which I'm not going to do. But um Gastroenterology is the place to go. There's a, a Catherine uh, alerted me to a meme that's going around. It said, so wait, we're in a cold war with Russia and climbing up that hill is like number one on the radio charts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And now my daughter's getting really angry with me because she says, listen to this, listen to this song. It's oh, yeah. really, listen to this childish Bambino song. And I'm like, it it's it sounds like this here. Let me play this song from thirty years ago. Right. It's like the exact. It's, it's the same song. He's using the string ensemble way up. He's got the the mutron on the guitar, and he's mm -hmm. got this, and he's got the, not to put it down. It sounds great. I mean, it's. I'm glad. I'm glad everybody's grooving on this stuff. Although I don't particularly like it when it came out the first time. Um, you didn't. But, you were not crazy about the Kate Bush uh, Hounds of Love album. Not really. Hmm. Not really. Wow. Um, Hounds of Love. No, there is one. Uh, Mother stands for comfort. To That's me, fantastic. Is a magnificent. But a lot of that is Eberhard Weber on the bass. Mm. It's, it's his playing on the on the bass. But it's also her too. It's a wonderful song. That's a great, 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 great song. It's like you know. Sometimes artists come forth with like a gem, like Thomas Dolby comes forth, you know, like Thomas Dolby, uh, uh, hyperactive, uh, the, the album, what's the second album he made after the album he made after, um, uh, Golden Age of Wireless. It's the one that had hyperactive uh -huh. on it and white city. Um, I forget the exact name of the album, Mulu, the, the, the God of the rainforest. Um, and I never really liked the album in general. It mm -hmm. just didn't do anything for me, but it has screen kiss. Screen Kiss has, is great. Is a magnificent tune. It's just yeah. such a gem. And the same thing with Mother Stands for Comfort. I just I think those are such gem songs. But yeah, I don't know. Kate Bush. Well, one of the ones that I love is uh, Cloud Busting off of the same album. Um, I don't know if you remember that. That was like Organon, about Organon, about there's somebody who used to like get people together and meditate inside pyramids and believed that he could bring the rain with special equipment that he had designed. Oh. It's interesting. It has, you know, like like some of Thomas Dolby, it has a, a historical bent. Yeah. And she did this, she did that one song where there's, you know, there's somebody under the water, she's skating on a frozen pond, and uh, there's something underwater, and it sounds like it's a submarine. Under ice. Um, yeah. Fabulous tune. I yeah. thought that was really, really cool. I thought those, it, it, it is a good album, but I honestly, running up that hill never did anything for me. Yeah. But, it's, I mean, that, it's that synth patch at the beginning. That's really fun. And and then the beat is really great. Um, you know, I mean, I can understand why. My daughter but, loves of it. That, of that album. It's not, it's not my favorite on that. Yeah. It's like, record. she's like the number one. It's like, <laughs> I mean, Stranger Things single handedly. There's something, there's some milestone that she's passed now. Like, it's like the number one female vocalist song at some point that mm -hmm. people were requesting online. Yeah. You know, a song that was written, what, 40 years ago? Yeah. yeah. And my daughter loved it. I mean, Lily thought it was great. She was totally into it. And I was yeah, like, it's like, well, there's more. Go to it. <laughs> now I'm just waiting, now I'm waiting for Stranger Things to do a, an XTC retrospective. Oh, my goodness. That would, that would be a great... <laughs> That'd be a great yeah. one. Sense is working over time. Yeah. Let's talk about a. Uh, let's see if we can find a, 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 a dictionary, a, popular, a, 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 a favorite TV program. Maybe uh, Game of Thrones will start using XTC as their soundtrack. That would, that or would uh, yeah. <laughs> Death and boobies. I'm going real big. <laughs> Speaking of which, I've been I've been watching. I've been trying to watch House of the Dragon, which is like a mm -hmm. game of. Game of Thrones sequel. I love Matt Smith. He's great. Prequel, it. right? It happens. Oh, prequel. You're right. You're right. It's a yeah. It's the Targaryens. Um, that's right. And I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I tried watching it last night and I kind of dozed off. It's a little slower. There seems to be more politics, or I'm not sure. I'm not sure about it yet. But what do they? Um, I, I should watch these shows. It would help. The problem is I just I, I read three of those James R. R. Martin books and after that I I just sort of developed an allergic reaction to the entire thing. 
Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's bad. It's great. I mean, it's fabulous, but I just, it just, it requires, we've talked about this before. It just requires so much investment to keep all, you know, to, to maintain a world that dense. Oh, and I yeah. just, I never got into it. But I mean, when you see, like I, sometimes when I watch these shows on TV, I'm like, why am I watching this show? Like really, what is it telling me? And mm. what, what am I getting out of this? Um, which is always a bad. You're not thing supposed to do, do that. That's not. You're not supposed that's to not what you're do saying. that. Not when you're watching TV. When it's like you when watch you walk TV, into a mall and say, "Do I really need this?" They don't want you yeah. to do that. No, 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 no. no watch no, no, the no. show and buy the stuff. Yeah, that's the I don't purpose. Know. But uh, I am cautiously looking forward to the One Ring coming out. That's on Prime. But I, I. Yeah, I fear the worst. Oh, Gurry, angry about her. No, I'm not angry. I'm just, it's, I don't know. To me, it's just a naked cash grab. That's all. Right. That's all. Let's right. just riff on some book and who cares? And and it's, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll probably watch a little bit of it to see. Maybe maybe they'll do better than Peter Jackson. I mean, Peter Jackson, as I said, they, they made he made great films. I don't, I don't think, think they'll do they're... better than Peter Jackson. It looks like a it just looks like constant battles from the from the previews and I'm not really sure, uh, you know, it needs a little more substance. Um because this is I mean theoretically it takes place after after the fall a, of Morgoth and then yeah, you it's know, the second the, age. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, you know, and I think they even go to the Valar, the home of the Valar. Um well, Arendel does that. Yeah, I'm. This is really turning to a nerd fest. But yeah, well, I'll take a peek. It came out today, right? Uh, yeah, I think either today or tomorrow. I'll watch. I'll watch a bit of it. I got yeah. nothing better to do. I mean, it's it's a three day weekend, so I can piss away some time. Oh, there you go. You, you got your. I'll tell you what. Movies. I do watch over and over again. What's and that? This and this. I don't know if you ever seen these movies. The two. I there's been many people who've redone Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. House. Was basically Sherlock Holmes. Yes. You know, that whole series with Peter yes. Laurie is his name. Never liked that show. I thought he was great. I thought he yeah. did a really good job. And I thought it was a really interesting idea. And I, I really admired, but I just found I just did not like watching it. Yeah, I found it too emotionally unnerving, a lot of it. Um hmm. and um and then recently Benedict Cumberbatch yes. did which I detested. Mm -hmm. I hated those. Those mm -hmm. really annoyed me. Even though I like him a lot. Yep. I like Benedict Cumberbatch. I liked all the actors yep. in it. Play but Watson. the whole feeling of the entire thing to me was so off key. Yeah. Strangely enough, the two movies with uh, Morton Downey Jr. Yep. I think the first one is really good. I think the second one called Game of Shadows is fabulous. I hmm. watch those movies over and over again. He is so magnificently funny. Yeah, yeah. He's I just I also do those. I thought and Jude Law is yes, astounding. As Watson, fantastic. And, and the dialogue between them. There's one point where uh, Irene Adler, you know, uh, Holmes is famous. One of his famous adversaries. Yes. You know, and and in the movie, there's some kind of romantic attachment between them. And and uh, Irene Adler says to him. Why do you? What reason do you have to to suspect me? And he says, "Do you want it alphabetically or in chronological? Do you want the explanation <laughs> alphabetically or chronologically?" And it's just good dialogue, funny stuff. He's funny. I just find those great comfort films. They're a lot of fun to watch. Huh. Um, so it's interesting because every a lot of people have riffed on Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, um, and it's amazing how some of them really fall flat to my ear. Yeah, um, and some of them are really good. Do you do you have? Uh, are you a Sherlock Holmes guy? Um, yeah, you know, I, I I read The Hound of the Baskervilles to my daughters, and they sort of enjoyed it. Um, the one that I really love is the one where he really gets into like the Mormons in Salt Lake City. Right, that was fascinating. Or not in Salt Lake; they were in upstate New York at the time. But there was a whole murder tie-in with uh, Church of the Latter Day Saints. And I didn't realize, but I read about later, that it was a real sensation going around England at the time. They couldn't, they found, they found them fascinating. Um, probably the more salacious details about 
uh, polygamy. Polygamy. Yeah. 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 The usual stuff. Yeah. And there's also one with uh, the KKK in it, the Five oh. Orange Pips. Okay. Yeah, the, be one that the mystery like of the five orange. I think it's called the five orange pips. Is about the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, it's. It, I remember reading about Arthur Conan Doyle. He based upon a Scottish doctor that he knew, and um, and I think also it seems like uh, Sherlock Holmes. the The idea was sort of a casualty of the First World War. That you know he wrote them, and then you know. Uh, Sherlock Holmes dies, you know, dies, quote unquote, at mm-hmm. uh, Reichenbach Falls. Um, but then uh, Arthur Conan Doyle brought the stories back later. But I think it didn't come back with the same feelings. I'm probably mangling this quite a bit, but it's interesting because it's definitely a pre World War One view of the world. Mm. Um, but it's great. It's a, a fast. I mean, so much comes out of Sherlock Holmes. It is an enduring. It is an enduring thing. It's it's interesting what comes out of that. Yeah. And some of his contemporaries, like Jules Verne and what was coming out of all those people at that time. It's like, because the the First World War just obliterated everything. There's really there's really a burn trench. It's interesting know? following the 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 literature and the ways of thinking prior to the the big wars. I mean, I don't know if you can trace it back to like America's Revolutionary War and France's uh, France's uh, uh, Liberation War, um, the French Revolution, or whether and whether literature changed before and afterward. But I definitely know that this happened during the Civil War, and I remember that uh, you recommended a book that dealt with that it was. Uh, sort of dealing with letters between Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson and I think it was I think you're mentioning the Metaphysical Club. Yeah, that was it. And it's letters by future Supreme Court Justice. Um, of course, I'm getting to that age where I completely forget the name the, of the guy. Mm-hmm. Um, he's he's very famous. I'm not going to remember right now. Um, writing letters from the battlefield to his father, yeah. who was a Boston Brahmin and a fierce abolitionist. Um, and the father said, you're fighting the good fight and you are carrying on God's work and you're doing a great thing. And he wrote back and he says, why don't you come down here and see what I'm putting up with? Yeah, Nothing's worth this. What I'm going through, nothing is worth what I'm going through and nothing is worth this. And you can take your abolition and shove it up your ass if you want yeah. to. Really, really interesting stuff. Oliver Wendell Holmes. That was it. That's how the book begins. Oliver Wendell Holmes was a private in the Union Army, and he was wounded three times and twice left for dead on the battlefield. Um, and he survived that. And the, one of the big premises of the book is that when he came through, the, the, he, was the, he was one of the founders, I think, of what's called legal positivism, which mm-hmm. is the – because people had tried to philosophize where does the law come from and right. what is the law? And it's this very platonic thing of what's the spirit in the law. And he was like – the law is the recording is the recorded decisions of judges. Mm-hmm. It's sort of almost like a a Gödel Wittgenstein kind right. of answer. Yeah, it's the like world is the a law. Is the case, yeah. The law is what has been decided by judges. That's the law. You can talk all you want to about what's hovering in the air or what's hiding underground, but all it really comes down to is what judges decide when they decide cases. Um, and his other thing is um, we got to keep talking. Mm. But the most important thing is not to is not to come to absolute decisions, but to keep in place mechanisms that keep dialogue going. Because, and this is the point that Louis Manon makes, who's the author of uh, the the Metaphysical Club, uh, and and I've met I met one law professor who said Louis Manon's completely full of it, and he completely mis- misinterprets everything. Mm. Uh, so, caveat. Okay. But what Louis Manon said is that Oliver Wendell Holmes, his the key thing that he took from the from the Civil War is that you can't let things get to this point. You got to keep people talking because once war starts, the wheels come off the wagon and things go completely completely. And I totally, I totally and utterly agree with him. Yeah. I mean, you know the the the. I'm sorry, I'm almost out of gas here. <laughs> um, the the object lesson. The key, the, the key object lesson of the 20th century, which was paid for with the blood of millions, is that the most advanced society 
in the world at the turn of the century was Germany. Yeah. Germany dominated so many things. Germany was kicking ass, taking names. Germany single-handedly created the, the chemicals industry, much of the electri- uh, electri- electrical electrical industry. Mm-hmm. Um, their, their higher education was the model for the entire world. P- countries all over the world sent young, uh, sent young people to Germany to learn how to, how to set up universities and run graduate schools. Um, and the fact that that nation, you know, 40 years later, 50 years later would be incinerating people. Um, the lesson from that is that anybody can do it. Right. Things can go really bad anywhere. And that there's nothing, there's nothing inherent in human nature that's going to stop that from happening. That people will do anything, right? If the conditions are right, if the incentives and the conditions are there, people will do anything. Well, it seems and yeah. so. You, and therefore, and I'm sorry. And therefore, my point is, you have to invest an enormous amount of money that you never get to those conditions. You have to, you have to take steps to ensure that you don't put people in that situation because if you put them in that situation, they'll behave that. There's nothing inherent about Germans or whatever you want to do because lots of people massacred lots of people all throughout the 20th century. Yeah. Um, what was what was mind-blowing was that uh, an adv- uh, it's not the German, but that the German society at that time, which was the most advanced, you know, widely considered one of the most advanced, most uh, intellectual, one of the most proud and sophisticated societies did that um yeah. and so what the lesson is is that nothing's going to stop you that people are people it doesn't matter if they're here or there or anywhere if you put people in a particular situation they're going to behave in a particular way so the key thing you got to do and once that happens then you're talking about really dire things you got to do at that point like atomic weapons you don't want to get there and so what you have to do is you have to put in place mechanisms to keep those conditions from arising. So anyway, that's I'm sorry. And what are that's the end of my Because we could uh, we could use a few of those. I think if we if we could just figure out where they are. Are they like big giant machines that like pump bubbles into the air, or are they? Is it something else? I mean, I how think, do we how do we keep it from happening here? Well, I think a good thing. I mean, there's some. I mean, a you have to keep it. You know, you have the double-edged sword of a fairly open society with fairly high protections for freedom of expression. Yep. You know, a lot of people agree. One of the key, as Lenny Bruce said, the First Amendment says you get to say anything you want to say at least once. <laughs> you may not get, uh, really, and it's may a not get brilliant another statement. Yeah. It's a brilliant statement, but he says you get to say what you want to say at least once. Um. And it's really important, I think, to allow people to say what they say, even if it's stuff that you really don't like. And of course, we, you know, and of course, there's guardrails around that, like, you know, there's certain things we're not going to talk about, yeah. um, there's certain things that are going to send you to jail. And in fact, Oliver Wendell Holmes was involved in that. Oliver, Oliver Wendell Holmes was the, I think, one of the key justices on one of the key cases for the extent of First Amendment protection, which I think was called Brandenburg. And mm-hmm. it's I think it's Oliver Wendell Holmes who came up with the test of there needs to be a clear and present danger mm-hmm. from what the speaker said. So if the speaker says, hey, all you guys, go and burn that person's house down, that's not allowed. Right. You cannot have a clear and present call to an illegal action. But but you can you can get really close up to that as we have learned. Yeah, like we're going to march to the Capitol. I mean, that's uh, yeah, yeah, and I'll be there with you. Yeah, we're gonna sh- we're gonna show them what's what. But you know, you can't say, hey, by the way, you know, bust down the doors and start setting fire to stuff because that'll get you into trouble. But you can, but I'm sorry, I digress. But <laughs> Jim's being very <laughs> Jim's like he's got to stop it. I, I had a point a while back, and I'm I'm sorry. To oh yeah, so no, it seems uh, what I find really interesting is before and after these wars, our our idea of what humanity is changes. Um, and you see it reflected in the writing, which reflects the, the general philosophy. I don't know what you call that. People call it zeitgeist or epistemy or something like that. But, you know, pre-Civil War, post-Civil War, pre-World War I, post-World War I, pre-World War II, post-World War II. I think there are great changes in terms of our envisioning of ourselves. And all of those, of course, are, you know, Western humans. Um, things, things are drastically different, although maybe similar in a place like Cambodia, 
Um, but, you know, you can sort of see like, it's a, it's a dimming, you know, the, the wars have a dimming effect on our rosy picture of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And the rise of surrealism. Way. That was one of the classic, you know, that's sort of like the, the textbook example is that after the first world war is the rise of surrealism which is just a rejection of reality where it, mm. it's not only we're not against the oppression impressionists. We're not against this or that. Or whatever. We're just, we're against reason. Mm. And that, you know, and, and that's when you start having, you know, Salvador Dali and yeah. you have um, these people who come up with this, you know, uh, uh, Rene Magritte, all this puzzling stuff all this inexplicable stuff. It's not meant to be beautiful yeah. uh, because René Magritte's paintings are not beautiful. He, he They're painted in a very sort of workmanlike way. Um, and But but it's this rejection of reason. And he defies um, rationality. It's almost as if, you know, he's poking fun is, is well, he's well, poking, it failed. Yeah, he's poking rationality holes in reality. Rationality failed. Yeah. It failed, and and everybody thought, well, okay, World War One, you know, democracies will never go to war with each other, and mm-hmm. nobody will kill each other because it's stupid. It makes no sense. Well, ta da! Yeah, <laughs> guess you had what? Mustard gas and trenches, and yeah, yeah, horrors. and nationalism, yeah. and radios, and the infinite productive capability of the modern industrial state, which can crank out basically an infinite number of bullets all the right. time. And right. so, and so, what they said is, you know what? This whole thing about reason and rationality doesn't make sense. It's not rational. Um, and so surrealism was a big... Uh, I mean, World War I was a much more incomprehensible conflict. World War II, because after World War I, like, nobody really... I mean, it was absolutely devastating. And you had a plague. And there wasn't... You know, the plague hit at the same time. The bird flu hit at the same time. And there's been a lot yeah. of revisiting of that, you know, recently... Um, but the the sense is it was so bad people didn't didn't even want to talk about it. My my grandfather on my mother's side he lost he lost all of his brothers and sisters and his mother to the bird flu. Wow. Yeah, I think he had no one brother survived. God. Yeah, and his father was very distant after that. It was like you know it was a tough it's a tough time. Yeah, um, World War Two is different. And he, and he was, enlisted. He was in the Navy in World War II. Yeah. He was on a, on a destroyer that got hit by a dive bomber. Or, no, by a uh, kamikaze. Yeah. And he had to float in the, in the ocean for a stretch waiting to be picked up. So that improved his temper. Even he, was, he was a jolly and funny man. Oh, that's great. Another, that's a um, triumph. Another friend of mine, uh, Arthur, C., uh, Arthur Surf Mayer, was in... Uh, it was it was the Battle of the Bulge. It was the the the. It was the battle where they were like frozen on top of this hill, and then kind of. It was one of the worst battles of World War Two. Well, there's Battle of the Bulge is best on France, where it happened during the winter, and yeah, they were all yeah, freezing. They're at, and they're encircled by the Wehrmacht. Yeah, he yeah. he felt that he was going to die so many times during that battle that when he got home, he was just the happiest guy in the world. He rode his bike around Manhattan. He worked with my dad. He was a sweet guy. Yeah. So, so you were talking about what are those mechanisms that keep people from doing bad things? Yeah. I have an interesting. I have an interesting answer to that because that's what I've been thinking about a lot recently. Okay. So, how do you get people do things on a large scale, especially? when you need them to do things where they do not necessarily benefit from what you're asking them. Hey, wash your hands every time you go to the bathroom. Yeah. Well, who cares? I mean, why should I, why, uh, you know, we could vaccination. Look, come on. Wear a mask. How do we, yeah, wear a mask. How are we going to convince people to do that? Well, we can explain it to them. And more importantly, where does political power, well, sort of a related issue, not exactly the same thing, but where does political power come from? And so I have some theories about this, as is my habit. But 
We all know that, you know, during the 1600s, political power came from God. There was kings. Right. And the kings, the, the state was intertwined with the church, and the, the king was ordained. King had the will of God. Then we had democracy. Because the problem is the kings didn't turn up, people didn't like kings that much, and they wanted to get rid of the kings. But the problem is, where does authority come from if not from God? Whatever this is means. the Jacobin issue. Uh, that actually was the big change that the Jacobins wanted to reinstate the line of James because, for that reason, because if the king doesn't, you know, they believe that the king was divinely, uh, right, implant, you know, uh, oh, sorry, the divinely assigned. And if the king was not divinely assigned, well, then why should we follow? What, well, yeah, Who Who do it's do we just listen political. To? Yeah, right. And the beauty of democracy is. We follow everybody. We don't follow one person. We follow, we follow the follow majority. Everyone. Yeah, but yeah. we the people. That's right. why the Constitution begins, we the people, because that's the source of authority. The source of authority, if you're a Declaration sheriff. Declaration of Independence. No. Constitution. Preamble. Sorry. <laughs> you're right. No, I think Declaration is when in the course of When in the course of events. Yeah. Right. yeah. No, so, okay, but, yeah, it's the preamble, which... Okay, we can totally Don't touch ignore. that dial. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, no, that, that's not it at all. I was just testing you. Oh, no. yeah, I knew. Right, it was a dark and so anyway. So, but that's why the Constitution begins with the people because the, the people are the source of political authority. Okay, great. But we've seen recently how democracies don't necessarily work all that great all the time. Right. There's their strength is their weakness, which is that. Um, it depends upon people being fed information. That's the whole function of a democracy is if you're going to allow everybody to cast their vote on an issue, they need to be adequately informed about the issue in, in order to cast an intelligent vote. Um, yeah, and, and also sometimes the masses are asses. I mean, sometimes people well, are just right. racist. and Maybe you know, we're wrong. Who knows? Yeah. But that's, that's the other problem, though. You, know, you can say that, and, and I would say that too. But who, who are we to go against the will of the masses? Because mm -hmm. that's the whole point of democracy, which is that, uh, you know, what the, what the public wants, the public gets. So anyway, AI. Interesting. AI. Who's going to, where does the authority come from? The authority may come from a superior intelligence. You may say, look, it's not coming from God. It's not coming from all of us yeah. voting. It's going to come from this box over here. Because this box can do more operations than any of us can ever think of. And this box, this, this computer, will more adequately, will more efficiently manage our society than we can. Now, I mm -hmm. know, I know the instinctive reflexive reaction to that. But I think it's something we're going to have to deal with. It's something we're going to have to think about and talk about and deal with because it's very alluring. It's very seductive, which is, hey, not only we, you know, before it was God, so there's only one person. It was right. God making the decision. Then it was everybody making the decision. Now we've got nobody making the decision. This is even better because we tried the God thing and it didn't turn out so mm. hot. And the democracy thing, that's got a couple of wobbles in it too. But what if we turn it over to an AI and the AI runs the whole thing and determines who's going to get what according to some algorithm? Um, mm. And I and I think certainly it's going to be very much AI-assisted governing, that the, the governance issues that we're dealing with right now are so large and so calm. I mean, we need AIs to predict the weather. We need AIs to do this. We need AIs to do that. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to need an AI to adequately because it doesn't seem to be working very well right now if you're of a particular persuasion which is yeah. that you know look it is absolutely crystal clear what's going on here with the environment with species loss with with habitat depletion stuff like that we're going to kill ourselves well actually mm -hmm. we're going to kill our children is what we're going to do but we're probably we may actually be good enough at it that we're going to kill ourselves and negotiating and talking about it is not going to get us anywhere. So usually the path to that is war. 
which is look i know what the right solution is you're not just you're not you're not paying attention to what i'm saying so here's a how it sir right that's usually the way things you, people try how to, to solve win every argument kind of, yeah yeah the final the final argument of kings um and so how do we avoid that again that's the kind of thing we want to avoid so can we all agree that this AI is going to be an impartial third-party arbiter to everything? Uh, I can hear I can hear Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos like rubbing their hands together right now. I mean, yeah, that idea. Because who programs the algorithm? Who who creates the AI? Who gives it its parameters? AI right now, of course, is very narrowly focused. They're very good at doing specific things. Um, generalized AI is. The fantasy is the, you know, is the singularity, the idea of a general intelligence that can take many factors into account and be good at many things. I'm, I'm listening. I mean, I'm, not, so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not doubting. We're not there yet. I'm so silent about, because Think I'm about thinking. what that would mean. So if you had an AI kind of running, running governments, you would have AI running the courts. There'd be one judge, right, deciding thousands of cases a second or a minute. And they would all be based on a general knowledge, not just of the law, but of the particularities of the case, what it means uh, to uh, put your fence three inches into somebody else's property or, you know, all of the different things that actually have human meaning or else it wouldn't feel like justice. It would feel kind of artificial. So I think it's, I think it's trickier. I think we're, we're still oh, a long I, way from that. I certainly think it's tricky, but it's interesting. I like the, I like the, I like the intellectual simplicity. Once upon a time, political authority came from one person. And in fact, if you go back farther, I think what happened was, you know, generally back in prehistory, it was the tallest and the strongest guy who had the political authority because he could kick everybody else's ass. So that's pretty straightforward. You know, that's 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 political power at right. its most right. and like Rev 1.0. Okay, but then we had to invent God because the society got too big and the guy couldn't kick everybody's ass simultaneously because now there's more <laughs> than 150 people and they're figuring out that they don't like this guy, so they're getting together and figuring out how to kick his ass. So we invented God. And then we invented, and then then came along democracy. So there's one person, then there's a supernatural person who's pointing appointing one person, and then there's democracy where everybody is thing. And then right now AIs are being used to make decisions all the time for us. I mean, AIs are everywhere, and and we use them all the time ourselves. You know, you mm -hmm. you analyze a situation. Even if you may be the person making the presentation, even may, even though you're making a presentation to a decision maker, or maybe you are the decision maker. You are surrounded by a. You're surrounded by computers feeding you analyses of data. Right. So at some point, you know, they feed you the data, and then you have to make a decision. At some point, is it that look, we keep making bad decisions? What if we just let the computer so? Right. For a Sorry. business, you might do it. As a matter of fact, in the entertainment industry, you totally do it already. You just follow what the computer tells you. Yeah, more or less. It's like, well, we got so much social media, you know, back well, on this. Well, it's Moneyball. That's, yeah, exactly. Same thing as Moneyball. You, yeah. just, you just run the spreadsheet and you make a decision based on the spreadsheet. You can theoretically fire all your scouts. You don't need right. scouts anymore. All you need is just the stats. Of, of all the players who are up for grabs. Right, and then you, you crunch them down. Right. And but, so, so, so let me just disagree with, in terms of the time frame, um, one thing that, one thing that I would, that I would just change in terms of what you said about, I mean, originally I think it's pretty clear that polytheism predates yes. monotheism. Yes. And, uh, but then there are monotheism uh, breakthroughs and then democracy comes along actually in a polytheistic uh, situation as far as I know for the first time in Greece so you you have pharaohs in Egypt but you have democracy of some kind in Greece and that's still while there are multiple gods I think when we move further into the Middle Ages then things kind of coalesce but I think a lot of that has to do with Constantine 
and his interpretation of, of the way Christianity should yeah. work, which was all about power. I, I, I was speaking very, very loosely, but what I'm trying to get at is there's this whole, one of the foundational problems of any political order is what is the source of authority? Who gave you the right to tell me what to do? Right. Now, if you're, if you're six foot ten and weigh two hundred and eighty pounds, okay, yeah, you're the boss. No, no problem. <laughs> Whatever you say, dude. I'm totally with it. I'm totally down with it. And then at some point you have to come up but once the society gets large enough, you have to come up with some kind of structure. Yeah, forget about just forget the whole religion thing. The whole the key thing is what's the source of authority? And and how do you and likewise the other thing is how do we keep we say this thing like how do we keep in a society from going off the rails but fundamentally there's people who want it to go off the rails you know and to a certain degree we're acting like little manipulators we're acting like we're acting like a cabal yeah you know extermination is a bad thing well for some people extermination is not a bad thing Right. And are they wrong? If they're wrong, what does that mean about dialogue and what does it mean about democracy? I well, mean, they, there's this tension between between everybody has a say, but there's also this sense that there's some things we don't talk about and there's some things that won't be tolerated. It's an interesting tension. Right. I mean, right now it really comes down to who has the best argument. But that argument doesn't appeal to logic necessarily or reason. It appeals to our emotions. So Sure, it's not even an argument. Who has the best meme? Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, but it's, it does, I mean, almost everybody who is in office was, you know, in debate club. Um, so it's not as if they're all philosophers. They just can argue either side of any issue really, really well and win the argument. So it does kind of come down to, you know, it's the influencer. But the influencer has some kind of argument. Even if the argument is they're coming to take your guns, it's still an argument that has to ring true to people. And then people follow right. that leader. And it might be that, you know, the argument is total nonsense. But if it somehow brings up certain emotions that are tied to mom and dad or something, then it then it wins with that group of people. So to answer your question, what are the mechanisms that we keep from what Lionel thinks society is going off the rails, which is when you start incinerating people? Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of like innocent people who have never hurt you. You decide to gas them. I consider that sort of a, a pretty bright line of when things have gone really far over the top. Yeah. So one thing I talked about is democracy is you know, a free press is a valuable thing to have. But as we can, as we saw, the means of mass communication can be, can be co-opted. Another, I think another important thing is you really have to make sure that economic conditions don't go below a certain point. Mm -hmm. That's the key thing. Because my reading of having read quite a bit about the origins of World War II and stuff like that is that you know, you have German society, which was which was sub either self-inflicted or whatever, was subjected to just shock after shock after shock after shock. You know, economic, you know, defeat in a war, uh, serious, you know, uh, serious depletion of resources. Everybody did in Europe. I mean, Europe basically starved in 1918 and, you know, they had no food. Yeah. The entire continent was on its ass to a large degree. Germany had to go through that massive, you know. Well, they were punished lose. economically too. There's a lot of debate about that. Really? But yes, yes. They were, I mean, certainly psychologically, certainly symbolically they were punished. And and many people argue that the reparations imposed upon them were ridiculous and humiliating and embarrassing and damaging to the economy. There's other people who strenuously reject that. But... We all know, A, Germany lost. Right. Two, um, a lot of people died. Yeah. Much as the French lost an enormous amount of people, so did the British. But they, quote unquote, won. 
So you can spin a different story. Whereas with Germany, you have all these, you, you lost all these people and you lost, and then your economy tanks and you're facing down a Bolshevik threat from the Russians. Um, and uh, then the depression hits. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, if you, if you take a society and bend it far enough, it'll start to do some pretty, again, if people will do anything, if you put the right conditions. Um, and so one of the conditions you really have to have, and, and you have the hyperinflation crisis of the Weimar Republic, which decimated a lot of private savings. Right. And then the depression happened. <laughs> so whatever's mm -hmm. left behind is the depression happened. So at that point, people get really desperate and people get, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I've never experienced it myself personally. But I think it gets really, really, I think at that point, people will do anything. And I think yeah. if you take any people, if you take a group of people from here or take a people, group of people from there, I think psychological studies have shown that human beings behave sort of basically the same, regardless, you know, with and there may be subtle differences between upbringing and cultures and religious affiliation, but fundamentally people will basically behave, this, you know, behave the same. Statistically speaking, there may be Magnificent human beings who put up with a lot of crap and still maintain their dignity, and there there may be some really deplorable people who will do awful things right off the bat. I don't know. I don't know. But I think I haven't heard that you know the Swiss <laughs> are mm. immune to anything, or you know the people from Ghana are immune to anything. So so the question is. So again, I think one of those key things is the economic thing is that you have to have sort of an economic floor because once people fall through that floor, all bets are off. And then again, just to put another cherry on the another another sprinkle on the whipped cream. Yeah. If you had an AI, yeah. you, you know exactly <laughs> well, so then this this brings up uh, the Ministry for the Future. Um, oh, here we which, go. In which I I feel like that was that was missing in some ways. Um, that somehow there was um, a a group of people at the UN deciding that nations should you know that basically Canada should just be a nature park, um, and that and that I think they did built it around a kind of pseudo religion, artificial religion, terrorist attacks. I have to say, I, I found that fairly unconvincing, but an interesting, I didn't book. get that far. Yeah. I got halfway through it. So is that what happened? They, cause I know at one point the guy says we need to create a new religion. Yeah. Yeah. And I totally agree with that. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. The, the earth religion really just, just mother earth. Um, I think is what, what more or less comes out of it. Right. It's slipping um, away from me now, so I'm probably getting some things wrong. Yeah, I should probably try to finish that book, but by, by the time I got halfway through, I was just like so angry. I was just so triggered. And what was it that was that made you so angry about it? I just don't like his everybody everybody sounds the same. Mm. Everybody talks the same way. The situations are all antiseptic. There's just it just feels like like little paper people mounted on pedestals moving like moving pieces of, it's like somebody describing a war by moving little blocks with flags over a map it's like that's not what it is yeah it's about yeah. people killing each other yeah and, no it, and, it, it it does read more like a platonic dialogue because he pisses me off the same way that neil uh, that uh that uh, uh neil stevenson does mm -hmm. which is that oh it's just a it was a rollicking good time no it's not yeah no, war is not a rollicking good time. It's horrible. And we make up stories afterwards to make it sound like it's a really love, you know, that there was winners and losers. But honestly, it's just a bloody slugfest where everybody's dignity gets trampled on to a large degree. Yeah. yeah. Um, and 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 the same thing with him. I, but, but I fundamentally, but the interesting thing with him is I agree with his ideas. I agree with what he's fundamentally talking about. I think he's on to the right things. I just... Again, it's like it's like I said about J.K. Rowling. I love her ideas. I love her stories. I just don't like her sentences. Uh huh. You know, uh -huh. they just <laughs> right. And, and with him, it's it's like I agree with your ideas. I feel your pain because you can tell there's a lot of pain in his heart. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that he's very angry about this stuff. Yeah. Um, so. And and yeah, and rightfully so. And I agree with that. I just I just don't like the way he writes. Yeah. 
Um, but he's right. There, there needs to be a new religion because the problem is, is you're trying to convince a very, very large group of people to do something to make sacrifices where they may not benefit at all. Right. And the classic way you make that happen is with a religion. Or the most fundamental religion of all, which I call the Book of Mom. Yeah. And I think I meant... <laughs> I'm sorry, am I just you did, like, yeah, no, hey, why do you brush your teeth? Why do you brush your teeth? Mom said so. Because mom said dad's going to be really pissed if you don't brush your teeth. <laughs> Well, I think my, I mean I think through that we just mom. end up with uh, we just end up with Christianity again where they've kicked mom out and dad just tells you but um I yeah I mean I I I think I think that's true. I think there is something to be said about what do we owe future generations? What do we owe the future? What is a future human being worth? And it it it, it dubbed That was smart. That yeah. was a clever part of the book. The seven generations thing, where the yeah. and I like that whole part of the book because the guy says, "Well, in my culture, there's this rubric of you are responsible for seven generations yeah. forward." And I thought that's what we need. We need numbers. Yep. When Tithing. we build this, what will it do to the seventh generation? I mean, if we're all about protecting the unborn, I mean, this is the ultimate way to do it, right? Don't don't get snarky with us. I'm, here. I'm, God, for, yeah, it's been I a agree. slow news month. You know, there's just pretty pretty much nothing happening in August. I'm just never mind. Well, I like the Ukrainian, I like the Ukrainian dog memes, but that's another that's for another story for another time. Um, but it's interesting because tithing, right? How do they come up with a tenth? Why is it eleventh? <laughs> I think Islam has a different one. Mm. I think Islam has a different percentage. I'm not sure what it is. And you but, kick that back to the church. Well, you just, I mean. Tithing, tithing for the future. But you have to pick a number. That's the key thing. Well, let's ask and the how AI. how do you pick a number? I mean, <laughs> right. No. Exactly. Because we can do it two ways. We can pick a number. Either a human being can determine it. Mm-hmm. Or we can ask the AI. And well, maybe it may, it may, go ahead. Uh, an AI created specifically for that purpose could do it now. I think. But you're right. You're right. It, it has human, in, I'm sorry, now, now that you're agreeing with me, I'm going to argue against you. Okay. But, no, I'm not going to argue against you, but I think it's fascinating because Edmund O. Wilson, which was mentioned very, like in passing in Ministry for the Future, I think he said a third or a half. Wow. You know, he said, and he said, it's not hard to do. He said, much of the earth is uninhabited. Right. And oh, yeah, says, a, a third of the earth or a half of the, no, it's a half of the earth. It's a half. Right. Yeah, no, no, that's what I meant by Canada turns into a nature preserve. Yeah. No, right. half, human beings basically huddle yeah, together and then, and then let everything else run wild. And right. yeah, a lot of, a lot of good comes from that. Uh, right. If so, you can actually make it happen. Right. And so how do you make that happen? Well, typically you make it happen with a sword. Right. Right. Because somebody Does wants that, to go in and log. I mean, you know, look at all these trees. Right. Or we run low on heating. And no food. religion has ever had to deal with that. No. Well, it has, though, because in India, they don't eat cows. So you have these dietary restrictions where you don't eat certain things, but that's an individual. That's an individual prohibition, not ex, not a not a mercantile prohibition. You're not prohibiting. Well, they do have things where you can't charge interest. So there's the anti-usury laws, which mm. are very common mm. among religions. I don't know. I'm sort of getting lost here, but it's. I think it's a fascinating. I think it's a really really fascinating concept, which is that how do you get a whole bunch of people? To do something. How do you try to convince them? And you can try to shove PowerPoint presentations at them. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be working very well. But maybe we're just impatient. We need more we meetings. Need we need to have more meetings. Just everybody. Yeah. We all more sit emails. in the meeting and yeah. we decide this stuff and get it done. But maybe the other thing to do is, look, you know what? We're not going to come up with a rational explanation. And this is what I'm dealing with with this document that I'm writing that nobody's ever going to read. Mm. Which is... Why are we here? 
Why are human beings here? I mean, if all the human beings disappeared tomorrow, would that mean anything? Because that's really what it comes down to. That's a fundamental question because I remember very clearly reading an article where the federal government was passing this rule to protect protect some kind of crocodile or alligator. Mm -hmm. I think it was in Florida or Louisiana. I don't know. Yeah. But it was in America. And because it's a crocodile or alligator, it's probably somewhere in the South. And um, and they said, we have to prevent them from going extinct. And they asked this one guy what he thought. He says, well, I never met a dinosaur. And my life hasn't been negatively impacted by that either. Mm. Which was his way of saying, well, who cares if the crocodile goes away? What does that mean to anybody? Good question. Yeah. It's easy. It's easy to write that guy off and say, oh, he's just stupid. Well, he's an ass. It's asshole. not. Yeah. It's not. It's not a stupid question. Um, it's it's a good question. What is the inherent value of all these? We can't preserve. Can we preserve everything? No, we can't freeze the earth at a particular point. There's this whole issue of the fact that things are always changing and species are going extinct and species are being created and all that kind of stuff. And so, again, you have to make that horrible decision of how much is enough. Is it half? Is it a third? Is it a tenth? Is it a twentieth? And so you have to make those decisions. But fundamentally, a lot of it comes down to, well, why? Why is it important for human beings to preserve stuff? Why is it important to protect the future ge future generations? Who cares? I'm going to be dead. What right. do I care? And I think the religion that I'm coming with up with is the beholders, um, which is that so far there's no evidence that life exists anywhere else in the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have a lot of evidence, so... <laughs> Stay tuned for further developments. Right. But right now, right now, this is a very, this is a unique place. Whether it's wonderful or not, it's a unique place. And secondly, right. we take joy in it. We look at it. We don't know if animals get really happy at a particular glorious sunset. We don't know if animals are really excited by how a particular flower looks. So can't answer that one. But what I can answer is that human beings really react to the world. Yeah, They love their pets. They love the sunset. They love the light. They love the trees. They enjoy it. It's a good thing. We like fresh air. We like swimming in a pond. And those are all good things. And that in itself is a good thing because there is somebody to behold this. There is somebody to see this and take joy in it. We don't know if animals take joy. I mean, they certainly seem to be happy when we give them like more food. Or, but all joking aside, we as human beings, we react. We behold. We perceive this world and we love it. And we can also hate it, but we can, but we react to it, and we tell stories about it, and we we praise it, and we extol it, and that is something really, 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 really special. And also, we can protect it because we are the ultimate predator, and as the ultimate predator, perhaps our job is to learn, you know, one of the things I say all the time is that, you know, millions who died in unjust ways, they've sent us a message. They paid for it with their blood. It'd be stupid for us to ignore that message. And that message is protect, protect the future people. Don't, don't let this happen again. That can get very complex. But the key thing is that we, we are special. So far as we know, human beings are very special. We live on a very special planet. The planet's very special in the universe, and we're very special on the planet because we, sit, we, we are in, indisputably on top of the order, the natural order, and we can destroy this planet tomorrow with a single press of a button. And we don't. And we shouldn't. I'm sorry, that's my rant, but I think that's the religion of the beholders, that we do have a purpose as a race, mm. as, as a group of people. We have a purpose, which is to behold. Well, and also, I mean, there's a sense of preserving 
future joy or protecting future joy. Yes. The, gu the guardians of future joy. Because we love giving things away. We love sharing, th you know, human beings naturally, I'm sure, are, I, we enjoy sharing things that we, like we're sharing t right now. Yeah. Although probably nobody wants to be there on the we're receiving. Sharing. We're, we're sharing. sharing. We're sharing and we like to share things and we like to give things away. And we like to help other people. When we see somebody in need, we like to help them within bounds. I mean, of course, there's, you know, there's 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 caveats to that. But people in general like to help each other out and like to share and like beautiful they like to share beautiful things with other people they like to say hey i heard this song i think yeah. it's really cool yeah. would you listen to it that is that is so fundamental that oh i really i found this recipe for blueberry pie it's really delicious you've got to make oh i read this book right you've got to read it we want others to share our experiences and so we tend to think of sharing laterally and then we share uh, in the other direction a little bit by teaching our children and say, hey, I think this is, as my daughter will attest while rolling her eyes, you know, I love this. I love Roxy music. Here's editions of you. Listen to this. Because right. we went to a concert for my birthday. We went to the Wet Leg concert. Do you know Wet Leg? No. Oh, you got to listen to Chez Lounge. Okay. Or Chez Long by Wet Leg. I'm sorry. Are we running over time Oh, here? yeah. Oh, yeah. Way <laughs> over time. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why don't you talk for a while? I'm I, sorry. I, I, no, no, no. I think I think we should it's wrap up. It's the Jasmine up. Silver Tip. I'm sorry. Um, it's the yeah, tea. just keeps you going. Plus the red wine. Plus um, the red wine. So yeah, I know. I, I I like this idea. The Guardians of Future Joy. Maybe that's the name of the podcast. We were in season two. Did you know that? That's why the music changed. Well, I figured we I took a month off. So year? now it's now this is season two. It's season two. It's season two. You can do the whatever, two they, towers. whatever you want. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, this is episode one of season two. A funny enough, funny but podcast. Go but, ahead. So here's what I'm. So I think there are two different. There are two different urges in humans. One is to be to be to seek approval, to get along socially. I think that's baked in because otherwise, really, I mean, we only really get we only we're only powerful because we're we work in groups, and so that came in early on. And so I think the people who are successful are actually people who ultimately get along with others. Even, even people that are calling for build the wall or whatever, that's, they, they have their own group and they get along really well in that group. The, but then on the other side, we are capable of horrible violence. Mm -hmm. And um, often, though, that violence is perpetrated because our group is threatened. So... We're afraid that our group will be dispersed. Then we do horrible things to keep it from being dispersed. But at the base of it, there is a root that is empathy. And the empathy is what allows us to get along socially. Right? If I absolutely can't at least look like I know what you're feeling, I'm going to have a hard time making any friends. Yeah, I'm if you're a hard sociopath, time getting off. It's not going to. It's not going to go. Although well. many sociopaths can imitate it, you know. I mean, yeah, many, I know. And, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. but they have to imitate it. It's, it's a huge effort. It's something they actually have to invest time in in learning how to do. So, um, those are the those are the two things. The guarding principles. I like the idea rather than a religion around a mother Earth, which ultimately the Earth will survive. Survive everything. The Earth will just not have any life on it. But the, I mean, it won't survive the sun blowing up. That, that'll pretty much kill it off. But <laughs> pretty much. You're starting to sound like me now. Okay, but if we invent a white hole and we pump the uh, antimatter. Okay, maybe, stop, God. And keep God. the sun from going. And then if we bring in a white dwarf, uh, and we <laughs> orbit the sun really fast. So, um, <laughs> and make a ring around the sun. The... Um, <laughs> What was I going to say? The sun, the earth. Oh, yeah. Instead of Mother Earth, uh, I love this idea of the guardians of future joy because. We are special. It's more. Yeah. We need to be there to observe. People need much to be of, there to observe and tell stories. Much, Yeah. Much of the history, much of the past 500, 600, 700 years of history has been to tell us that we are not special. Mm. The earth mm. is not the center of the universe. 
It's, mm. uh, you know, we orbit, we, and there's nothing special about the Earth, and there's nothing special about the Sun, and there's nothing special about mankind. Um, we descend from, we're part of an overall program, we share DNA with everything, and nothing special, nothing special, nothing special, nothing special, and you occupy no central position. But my answer is, we do. Because mm. we can blow the Earth up. And we can talk about whether we're the only tool makers and whether parrots are tool makers too. Fine. We can talk about whether we're the only ones who have language. We can talk about how somebody else has language too. Fine. But the macaws are not going to blow the freaking planet to smithereens. We could do it today. Interesting. So I was just talking to my youngest daughter today, this morning, over breakfast. This is how it goes in my house. And somehow and said, we... Hey, we can blow the planet. <laughs> no, seriously. Somehow the topic went to... Uh, locusts, and uh, I think she was saying, you know, human beings are, you know, have, you know, too much power, and we can do too many terrible things and, and destroy the world. I said, yes, it's like we're locusts, but locusts will destroy everything they come in contact with, so that, and she said, but, you know, but other species can survive. I said, no, when locusts wipe everything out, everything in the area dies. We're locusts. But we can choose. We can stop. We can decide. And that and does to, make yeah. us different. That makes us special. And so I said, really, everything is going to be about whether we decide, whether we wipe everything out, or whether we preserve the joy of future, future generations. Right. So human beings, so we are special in the sense that we can destroy everything. That's indisputable. Yep. We could. Um, well, yeah, we're we, doing it. Yeah. Yeah, we are doing it fairly slowly, but we could do it tomorrow if we really wanted to. We could probably just incinerate, blow the thing to smithereens if we wanted to. Yeah. So that makes us special. We are special in that sense. You know, because again, I've heard people say, well, you know, the whales talk to each other and there's communication. Okay, fine, great. They talk and maybe somebody can do addition. I don't know. But the one thing they can't do is they can't blow up the planet. Right. We can. And they're not You're currently the consuming all the resources in the world. Right, they're not. So, I mean, you know, so I, I, I told her that, and then I said, okay, I'm going to work, see you later. <laughs> she was like, bye, Dad. People are, <laughs> but people are making decisions. People are making decisions. And one of the things I don't like about the dialogue about climate change is that there seems to be this general thing that governments have to make decisions. And that may be a true statement, but I don't like that everybody just necessarily assumes that that's the way it's going to go. I think people need to make decisions, too, and I think they are making decisions. People are making decisions to buy electric vehicles and put solar panels on their roofs and change their diets and change their habits and do all that kind of stuff. And I think sometimes, the again, much of, much of what we understand about the world comes mediated through media. Yeah, the stories we are told from a, from a screen is that necessarily reality? I'm not no, sure. No, 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 we know because like here's an example that's local today. Uh, uh, you know, a um, hundred thousand cars drove down Sturrow Drive today, um, but that didn't make the news. They 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 went down Sturrow Drive and they got to where they were going. The what made the news were the U-Haul trucks that drove down Sturrow Drive and had the tops ripped off. Right, because people are coming back to school, which oh, ha it happens story. every year. Right, it's stirring. Oh, it's fantastic! I'll send you. I'll Fabulous. send you pictures and video. It's it's like a holiday here for Bostonians. We just we can't wait for the stirring, and yeah, they're like, oh, that was a haircut, or that was a sardine. Um, <laughs> it's fantastic ah, because every ah, year, no matter how many signs you put up, people. <laughs> They get I, and and honestly, how many things do you need in a dorm room? How can you put a whole U-Haul truck full of stuff into a dorm room? Back of a car, back of a car, a trailer. But yeah, they I get in the U-Haul and they bang into those bridges. Bam! Wow. Right on the story. Yeah, go to Charles it's Street amazing. Bridge. Blammo. No, what I think is fascinating. It reminds me of like the uh, British. Oh, wait, wait. The British Isles. And these are the smart people. Right, th sorry, these, these are the people, these are the people with an IQ admitted. higher than average. No, no, these are the people running who got their admitted. truck. <laughs> well, it's 
Yes. Well, let us be not terribly dismissive. But what I thought about, what, what immediately came to mind was the the uh, the people in England who lived in local towns and they lived near places where ships would wreck. Mm -hmm. And then when ships would wreck, they, they'd row out. They wouldn't <laughs> save anybody. They just grab shit out of the water oh, and like shake. And yeah, you want us to rescue you? How much money you got in your pockets? Right, right. See, that's what I would do. I'd, I'd have a gang that would like, I'll help you with your U-Haul. What do you got in there? Right. What, what can you help me with? <laughs> Uh, but getting back to serious matters, yeah. So we hear these stories that are mediated through the press, but how much personal experience do you actually have talking to people about what they're doing to address these issues, these contemporary issues of human impact on the environment? What I have conversations with is I talk to my neighbor, who's right out there, yeah. about how he put solar panels on his roof. And I talk to my the guy that I work with. Now I work at a university. Yeah. But I live in Texas. You're in Texas. Not exactly so how did he, a hotbed of liberalism. How did he feel about putting solar panels on his? He was totally with it because he 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 can. I I don't I don't know I don't know the guy well enough. Mm. Uh, he doesn't strike me as particularly liberal. He doesn't strike me as particularly conservative. What it's, what struck me is that he was very he was very uh, much concerned about making. Sh he was very angry because he set up these panels and he's actually done the thing where he's hooked it back up to the grid. Yeah. So that he can pump energy back to CPS and, he, and which then he is the company. It. He had a fixed rate. And. CPS was dragging their feet, according mm. to him. Mm. And he was very angry about the paperwork he had to go through to for CPS to take it off the grid. So his motivation may be purely economic, or there may be a mixture of ideology. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised either way. I just don't know enough about the guy. Well, it's interesting. We were talking about how do you get people to do what you want them to do en masse. And we did leave out a huge gaping hole in that, which is generally anger and fear. Or disaster. I mean, I really do talk about the Book of Mob, mm. which is the bios of society. You know, mob, I think a lot of things happen between the ages of zero and five. And moms are really important. I'm speaking in very sort of dated terms, but, you know, the Book of Mob is a very important book, which is, you know, you know, wash your hands before you do that. You know, stop running around. Be nice. If there's if there's mm. if there's commandment number one in the book of mom, be nice. Um, and it's very very important because it's easy to make fun of it and to joke about like I'm doing right now. But the book of mom is really important because that is like the assembly language of society, a mm. lot of it, which is be nice. Um, you know, sit down, eat this. You know, don't waste things. Don't throw things around. Don't be violent. Right. Be nice to your sister. Be nice to your, you know, be nice to your siblings. Don't punch people. And we could go on and on and on and on about it. But things got worked into that book. Brush your teeth. Yeah. Very interesting. Why does mom care whether you brush your teeth or not? But we all had, you know, that was the book of mom. Bru wipe yourself when you, go <laughs> when you go to the bathroom. Wipe yourself. You know, be clean. Yeah. Hygiene. Hygiene. Hygiene is a very fascinating concept because this is one of the most purest distillations of this whole point, which is that if everybody else is practicing hygiene, I don't. Nothing bad's going to happen to me. If everybody else in society is practicing hygiene and I don't, well, nothing's going to happen to me. Something will happen to you. You'll get, you'll, people will move away from you. They won't want to talk to you. They won't right. work with you. They won't want to deal with you. Right. Because it's gross. Yeah. It's gross, and that's how we boil it down to something that people can understand. Because, you know, I said to people, again, this is part of me training people in information security, you know, why should you, why should you wash your hands after you go to the bathroom? And somebody said, well, because there's germs. I said, no, 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 no. You know, why do you brush your teeth? Because mom said she's going to smack you across the face if you didn't brush your teeth. But why wash your hands? But let's take it a step further. Why wash your hands and why do all this? Why, why bathe? Nothing's going to happen to you if you don't bathe. Nothing bad medically is going to happen to you. You're not really, you're not really hurting anybody well, else. Well, I mean, tell that, tell that to the, uh, to the Europeans in the, in the 11th century. I mean, 
literally well, nobody no, but it, did. Yeah. Well, no, he did because they couldn't because they never running water. But today we have all this stuff, and so the whole point is, if you don't bathe, it's gross, mm -hmm. and you'll be shunned. Why are you being shunned by other people? Because the Book of Mom. Oh, that smells bad. You smell bad. Right. You need a bath. Did you, did you take a shower? You need. You need to take a bath. Yeah. You smell. Did you wipe yourself? Right. Because something smells really bad here. Why? Why does mom say that? Because her mom did. Be yeah, because there is this. At some point, there is this consensus that hygiene was important. And that appearance and high it's really complex. I, I don't want to go too far into it right now because I'll just make stuff up. But it's really fascinating because we need to develop the same thing about the about our relationship to our physical environment to the earth. Well, this is that's a gross. The fact that you cut down that tree, it's just gross. Right. Right. Distasteful. Well, of course, this is also how a lot of smoking got eliminated. It smells bad. It's it gross. took a lot of work. It took a lot of work, but a lot of people died. Yeah, and a lot of people fought in complete, <laughs> completely unsung and unknown and untold. Yeah, but that's what it takes, and a lot of people worked at it. it took a long time. Do we have a lot of time? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure we have a lot of time. And so that's the problem is how do you deal with this stuff? So I think about AIs and I think about all this other stuff, but I think about I think about sometimes all takes like this is <laughs> if we want to you need to go, you gotta you gotta talk to your family, right? Yeah. Okay. But let's cut it there. But the idea is we're basically welcoming our AI overlord. We're gonna name it mom. And um, let me put this in front of you. Let's talk about this next time. Or okay. let's not. Because you're probably going to, you're probably going to like burn this section of the day. I, there are a number of things I want to, I, I, there are a couple of things I want to talk about next podcast. Um, next podcast, actually, Dan Cantor is joining us. So we'll be talking okay. about music. And I'll keep my mouth shut. I'm sorry. You don't have to keep your mouth shut. That's just I'm sorry. I talk so much. But something fascinates me about history. There's a couple of things about history that make, that I find really hard to understand. Okay. Like Christianity. Ah. How did that take over the Roman Empire a hundred years? But I, so there is a simple answer. There is a simple answer. Well, there's a very simple answer. It's the word of God. Well, yes. There's and that no. answer. Yes and no. We can, we can never forget that answer. Well, that's just, that's an answer. My answer is, should, it, it comes down to, by this symbol, shall thee conquer. Which is supposedly the, the, what, was, what came to the Emperor Constantine in a vision. And the symbol was the crucifix. Because up, to, up until that point, the symbol of Christianity was the fish. And the crucifix then, uh, Constantine marched into battle with soldiers carrying well, not so. Oh, yeah, soldiers were carrying crucifixes, and they would march into a town with crucifixes. It's just symbol. That, it's well, like a swastika a symbol, but it's also a torture. We got to cut this part out of this. We're not going to air this. Why? Oh, because it's what actually Christian. Well, because I said we're talking about crucifixes, and then I mentioned a swastika. That's not. Oh, that yeah. Endear us right. to anybody, but okay, go ahead. But. No, I mean, that's a good point. No, it was not the same. I don't consider them equivalent, of course. No, but I'm it, just saying. But a think about it. At the time, a crucifix didn't mean anything. It didn't mean Christianity. It didn't mean Christ. It meant, we will hang you on this. Death. It meant death. And in fact, when I, when I was, when I was trying to, I was trying to like be a good, fa a good religious father to my daughter. And I spent some time at, at the Episcopalian church in Corpus Christi. The guy said, well, we, the guy who's teaching me said, well, yeah, it's kind of weird. We don't walk around with, with like, uh, necklaces with electric chairs on them. Right. Right. And I was like, oh, yeah. 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 Right. Wow. Yeah, it's how you put people to death. In and a I heard that from you? Life. Yeah. <laughs> you're the guy who's supposed to be, you're the guy who's supposed to well, be. He probably went to, you know, he went to, he studied theology. But it's fascinating, but it's, it's such a, it's such an, 
but to me that gives me hope because it you can can I got to so what leads to that either a there's it's inexplicable or b it's the word of god god wants us to be christian or c it taps into something deeper it's it, it's something fundamentally there's something fundamentally about there that resonates with human beings in ways that's very hard for us to understand cuz i don't understand it i don't get it but then again, I didn't grow up Christian. I, I didn't have mom taking me to church every... I think a lot of... I have my own personal opinions, but it doesn't matter. It's, it could be the word of God, and I am not saved. It could be that I am, I, I'm, I'm not in the fold. Well, That's fine. It, the problem is I just feel like it, uh, ultimately it doesn't help because the word it just... It ends up being, meaning whatever you, whatever powerful person wants you to think it means. Right, I mean that's another problem with right. it. And, and the, the word, the word is not enough. The word is not enough. Right, it can be co-opted. Um, symbol, you know, future generations, we could walk around with question marks on chains. I, I don't, I don't think that's going to work. Um, <laughs> so, we didn't solve it, Lionel. We didn't. Okay, not yet. You got to go. To, you got to go. I, I should. It's been an hour and a half. I don't. I, I can't imagine anybody can make it through this entire thing. But it's good to be back. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Okay, I gotta go. Somebody's knocking at the door now. Okay. I gotta go. Talk to you Bye. next week. Bye. The Funny Not Funny podcast is produced by me, Jim Infantino. Music by Jim's Big Ego. This song is called Where the Money Is. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And please remember to leave us a rating review. Thanks a lot.